Rani, you can go ahead. You're muted. I have to go ahead. No, I'm not muted. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. G greetings from, from uh, Sapan. And welcome to celebrating three years of Sapan Art in South Asian Voices. I'm Khavar Mumtaz, a Sapan member speaking from Lahore and your host for today's program. As we start today, I would like to send warmest greetings, Easter, happy Easter to all those people who are celebrating Easter. So welcome to this event. Today's program has three segments. First, an overview of what we have done over these three years. Second, a discussion on art and South Asian voices with acclaimed artists. Third, music and inspiration from three amazing feminist activists in Bangladesh. We are also delighted to announce that we are starting an essay competition for three different age groups, about which we'll share details in due course. Uh, as we begin, I think a, a few house rules. Um, mute your microphones. Also, please introduce yourself in the chat. Use the chat for questions or comments as we go along. And please stay on topic. Be patient with technical difficulties. And as always, we invite your suggestions and feedback. Now, let me share a brief back background of who we are and why do we do this? That is, why have we set up this, constituted this network? Three years ago, in March 2021, during the isolating COVID times and a time of renewed tensions between Pakistan and India, a group of over 80 friends and friends of friends from around the region and diaspora met online. We acknowledge our similar interests and desire for regional solidarity, given our common heritage and history, and the need to connect like-minded individuals and organizations for a minimum common agenda. At the end of that meeting, we launched the South Asia Peace Action Network with the founding charter and key objective of campaigning for a visa-free South Asia. The three-point founding charter has now been endorsed by nearly 80 organizations and hundreds of individuals in the region and diaspora. It calls upon the governments and, and, and peoples of South Asian nations to, number one, institute soft borders, to allow freedom of trade and travel to each other's countries. Number two, ensure human rights and dignity for all citizens, including religious and ethnic minorities. And three, cooperate in all areas, particularly related to public health, culture and reform, education, environment, climate change, etc. The charter is also online to, in several languages at www southasianasiapeace.com. You are welcome to endorse the charter if you haven't already done so. In fact, we would be very happy if you do so. We began holding virtual public discussions on the last Sunday of the month with subjects, experts to further explore cross-cutting issues. Over the past three years, the network has expanded and is growing with activists, artists, young and old, and thought leaders from across South Asia and the diaspora and expatriate communities uh, of South Asian origin. In August 2021, the news network syndicated featured services, which began operating in the, initially under the umbrella of SAPA, but it is now an independent media outlet sending out features to dozens of publications. The SAPA Foundation has recently been registered as a nonprofit organization in Boston. SAPAN amplifies the wealth of multidisciplinary and multi-generational information, knowledge, experiences, talents, and dreams. Sheer hard work, time investment, and labor of love and hope is the hallmark of this network. Today, as we celebrate the third anniversary of this unique initiative, we applaud members of the, this dynamic network, activists, professionals, and intellectuals from all walks of life. We reiterate our resolve to full our dream, dream, sapan, of a peaceful region.
We begin our discussion by remembering those whose work and ideas we are taking forward. I will now hand over to journalist Bina Serpa, another SAPAN founder for this part. Thank you, Rani. Um, it's really, I'm really, really honored to have you with us um, here and to take our mutual cause forward. And as you mentioned, Sapan uh, builds upon the work and ideas of so many who have gone before us and many who have, we, are, we are fortunate to have still with us. It was Dr. Mubashir Hassan who said to me many years ago that if France and Germany can be part of the EU, why can't Pakistan and India be part of a South Asian Union? I told him it was never going to happen. And he replied, Par hum baat to kar sakte hain, but at least we can talk about it. Dr. Mubashir Hassan is one of among the many who have worked tirelessly for peace and took these ideas forward, along with many others um, that we um, uh, have with us on a screen that I will just share. Um, people like Dr. Mubashir Hassan, uh, Nirmala Desh Pandey, Kuldeep Nayar, Asma Jahangir, uh, Rehman Saab, Kamla Bhaseen, Sufia Kamal, Sanya Hussain, Rubina Segal, Sabine Mahmood, Dr. Saman Keligama, Dr. Ekbal Ahmed, Praful Bilwai, Rajni Kothari, Madanjit Singh, and so many more, um, who we cannot absolutely, um, we cannot have um, uh, mention here. But uh, before we go further, there are three further losses we've had since our last meeting that we would like to just pay special attention to. Um, sorry, I'm trying to move this forward. Um, Barbara Ayaz, um, our journalist, activist, author, and longtime um, member of the Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy and of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. Um, Radhakan Saxena uh, in Jaipur, uh, also human rights activist, advocate of India and Pakistani prisoners. He was an all in uh, India jail services officer and member of the People's Union for Civil Liberties based in Jaipur. And not least, um, our beloved uh, Ramu Ramdas, former chief of the Indian Navy. Um, I'm sorry, it's... He was with us from the start, um, from the Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy. He was a chairperson of the India Pakistan Soldiers Initiative, and it's really hard that we're having a meeting without him now. Um, so I'll just hand it back to Rani now. Thank you. And maybe we just have a moment to remember all these people who uh, take whose work we take forward. You're muted, Rani. Over to you, Rani. You are muted, Rani. Sorry. Thank you. Has she frozen? I think um, Rani, you might have been frozen. I think, uh, is Rani still on mute? No, she's not mute. I think her screen has frozen. She was having internet issues. Um, I'm sorry, actually, I was supposed to hand it over to Sarita to share an overview of what we've been doing over the last few years. And I'm really sorry, I completely missed up the screen as usual. So Sarita, it's actually over to you. Where are you? Thank, thank you, Bina. Let me try sharing my screen. Um, there you go. Second. You're spotlighted. C can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, as Bina said, this is a very huge moment for us. This is something that we have done, 
we have done a try are trying to do last three years a lot of tireless nights and day sleepless nights actually where we are trying to put a bit on the mission and vision that we are trying to go through hello everyone my name is sarita Vertola, one of the member of south asia peace action network i'm really happy to present you a brief introduction of what we have done since last three years just to start with where the sapan came from the whole idea of sapan started with bina server samir gupta and vishal sarma who on 20th of march 2021 decided to bring people across the reason to discuss about how we can bring peace in South Asia. Initially, um, 93 individuals participated in the event and signed the founding charter. Um, Rani just a couple minutes ago read this founding charter. And then at this point, we have 489 individuals and 79 organizations who have already signed the founding charter. So after the meeting on 28th of March, 2021, there are a lot of volunteers, hundreds of volunteers who work together to um, bring this organization to the stage that we are now. So there, um, so our beloved um, Ekta Kapoor, she actually created, volunteered to create the website for Sapan and Sapan News, whereas Vishal, um, from the very beginning, he's a pillar. Uh, he's a he's a super volunteer who created the logo, who um, created the social media, and um, who was who actually worked a lot in first couple years. He's doing PhD, so he took a bit of break, but he's still here today, um, despite of his busy schedule. And um, there are a couple of the events that I would like to highlight. What we are doing to promote the culture of dialogue in the region. We do webinar. We try to do monthly, but we are not. Um, but most of the month, we try to do a monthly webinar. We have a peace mongers WhatsApp group where we promote the culture of dialogue in the region. We do write. Uh, initially, we started on the web page of South Asia Peace Action Network, but we talk about South Asia through our another website, Subban News. It's a, and then we do send a newsletter to the. Uh, people around the South Asia and diaspora. So you can see the picture. The first logo with the green one is the one that Vishal created. And then we now use the other one on the right side. In this logo, the, right, the one on the right side was created through the logo competition. So in last 2021 to 2023, um, we had... 20 a series of Imagine Neighbor in Peace webinar, two on country focus, two family literature night, three fundraiser, and one film, film club. During the time, we had a 46.9K Facebook outreach and 3.6K Instagram outreach. So there are a couple of the data that I have put together. If anyone wants to know more, we I would be definitely happy to share you more information after the event. So on you know, a couple of the milestones I would like to highlight is uh, we launched our SAP and News as a separate institution on 2023. We are now registered nonprofit organization in Massachusetts. And we also organized um, our huge fundraising this year. Um, I have um, kind of, it's a very uh, small table, but we um, we have raised almost $50,000 this year. We have almost 104 articles and 30,000 viewers through our SAPA news. And I would like to give a big kudos to Samir Gupta, one of our founder who was our financial sponsor for first two year where um, most of our website and basic requirement, um, he was only the financial sponsor for first two years. Mm. I would like to share you this screen. There are hundreds of volunteers who contributed uh, to Sapin, but I would like to highlight this 22 names. Um, I'm sorry if any names are missing. There were lots of names, um, but the people who actually were here since the beginning and contributed 
a lot. Each and every minutes are very valued. But I would like to thank Bina Server, Vishal Gupta, Samir, Vishal Sharma, sorry, Samir Gupta, Ekta Kapoor, Priyanka Singh, Kushi Kabir, Kaur Mamtaz, Kavita Shrivasta, Rohit, uh, Namrata Sharma, Urmi, Mandira, Sara, Salazar Rao, Sneha, Pragya, Fazia Deva, Shishmita, Aisha, Alia, Shahil, and Suz, uh, Suzadin. Um, there are lots of volunteers. These are a couple of the names uh, that has contributed a lot of hours uh, to how what we are doing today. There are a couple of the picture, our new logo, a couple of the resolution that we carried last three years, and the mainly the petition that we are still uh, doing. And then we are looking ahead for more continuous growth, more community engagement, and more impact in the region. Thank you. And if you, if any of you have a question, you feel free to share the question in the chat. Then I'll hand back to Rani. Thank you, Sarita, for that presentation of what we've done in the last three years. We have now a Five minutes for question and answers and discussion. If anybody wants to ask any question at this point, please introduce yourself and share your questions. If you've already shared them in your in the chat, we'll take them up. And Vidya will read out some of the questions. Vidya, are there questions? Please do read out so that we can have the answers from Sarita and Bina and or anyone else. Bina, there is a question yes, for who made the logo. Do you mind sharing the name, please? Yeah, um, so the the uh, current logo was made by, uh, the current logo was made by Abdul Hamid, who is in Vancouver. We had the, um, we had a logo competition and the, the information actually is on the, uh, on the website of South Asia, of Sapan News. It was originally on South Asia Peace, but we moved it to Sapan News. And I'll just very quickly share that just to show people that there is a story. The the um, if you go to this and you search for um, logo story, it's actually a really lovely story. Um, the Sapan logo story and how it happened and how we created the page and uh, then the the judges and that's Hamid and he actually had worked with me at the news on Sunday in Lahore uh, and he won the logo competition uh, quite by chance I didn't realize that it was him and when I found out it was him I was very happy because I was like okay I can ask him to tweak this and that so yeah thank you for that question and then Vishal uh, is the one who created our first logo if, if anyone want to highlight I will just spotlight Vishal um, yeah, he he's the he's the hero for creating the logo, uh, creating the social media page, working tirelessly on first couple of months to set up all the volunteer and activities are done properly. Yeah, and I just want to add that Vishal is not a graphic designer. He was a law student in India at the time, and he's now doing his PhD in in the state in in, in the UK. And we are just so proud of of uh, Vishal and all that he has done and his commitment. And I would like to spotlight Samir if he's here, who is along with Vishal. Samir, are um, you there? Say something. Hi. Hello, everyone. So Samir, I was um, back. I was reviewing the, all the reports. Sometimes we keep going uh, and then we don't realize how many volunteers we have, who have contributed, how much. And then I realized Samir is only the fiscal financial sponsor because of whom we had this awesome platform of like Zoom, our website running. And Samir, kudos to you. Okay. Um, I think this any is this questions? is all from the. I don't think see there is any other question. If there is any more question, we can respond later on and then go back to the continue with the event. <laughs> I think we should move on. Move on, yeah. Uh, with yes, there. Okay. There are no other questions. No. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should move on to our our major session that we are awaiting, which is the um, discussion on art, art and South Asian voices. But before we, I introduce the the, the three uh, panelists. I would like to uh, ask everybody to please wait till the end of this because we the uh, the event ends with uh, a solidarity song by the feminists. So please do wait for it till the end. So here we have the three people that we have today, eminent curators from around the region to talk about this topic. This is Manmeet K. Walia, is a curator based in London and Delhi, an art professional with degrees from renowned institutions in England, Chelsea, St. Martin, Sotheby's, she was a bad. Are you running? Can I just quickly? Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but can, sorry to interrupt, but can I? Can we just ask yes. the panelists to turn their videos on so that we can? Um, Salima Hashmi, Manmeet Singh, and Roshan Mishra, if they can turn their videos on, so we can have them. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Okay, so uh, uh, Manmeet was listed as one of thirty-three <laughs> women. Uh, in, uh, women in Excellence of 2023 in India. She's committed to making a global ecosystem that connects and promotes emerging artists from the South Asian region. Uh, we have Roshan Mishra, is the director of Taragao Museum and a Kathmandu-based visual artist, as well as an educator. He oversees the Nepal Architecture Archive. Roshan is the founder of Global ne Nepali Museum and an initiator of the Mish Mishra Museum. He's now actively involved in the Nepal heritage repatriation campaign to bring back Nepal's lost and stolen heritage. And then we have with us Salima Hashmi, a Sapan founder member and artist and art educator who needs no introduction. But for those who don't know, she is also a curator and contemporary art historian, a recipient of several national and international awards, including an honorary doctorate. She served as the principal of the National College of Arts, a premier art institute of Pakistan in Lahore, after years of teaching there, she was she has authored numerous books and curated art exhibitions of contemporary art and textiles in Pakistan and abroad. So I now hand over to the panelists. Now, well, I'll start off then, since I seem to be the most ancient one among the three of us. Um, so I'll take precedence, as very often the elders do in South Asia. We're very familiar with that phenomena. Um, so greetings, everyone from Lahore. Um, it's evening here, or almost night, but there's it's morning and noon elsewhere in the world. Um, and across South Asia, uh, different timings, we're half an hour apart from one another. Um, but I particularly want to say um, welcome uh, to our new friends. I mean, some of those whose names we are familiar with, they are our old pals, but this is especially for people who are joining us for the first time today. And uh, that's always wonderful because we really, really want to lure you into this network. It is a network for peace, but it's also a network for creative thought and how we can bring all of the things that we hope for and wish for for our region together with the help of those who reside here and for the help with the help of those who are across the planet but still carry within their hearts a desire and a hope for the well-being of this people well the way that um, manmeet and i met was uh, i think one of the positive fallouts of covid that you know when you couldn't meet one another and you find that okay there's this interesting exhibition and she <coughs> happened it's happening in delhi and she happened to have a pakistani artist who i knew very well who I'd mentored for a bit, uh, among the artists. So now this is an interesting phenomena that has been happening slowly but surely across South Asia. It is built on perhaps our, um, our forebears. They were, after all, the modernists in our region. And a lot of them knew one another before borders were so, so sharply drawn. And so you had these people who were the beginning of the modern movement in South Asia. And we really, the young people stand on their shoulders. Our... So, um, uh, Manmeet will come up with some of the names, but I'd just like to finish how I met her. 
So she invited me to speak on one of the panel discussion that they had. And of course, great for Zoom, which has blossomed because of COVID. So I was part of a panel discussion. Very soon we decided to meet up at Art Dubai in um, the you know, and away from the region, as we often have to do, both artists and curators and so many others. And um, we got talking and found that we had, you know, I we were about uh, 70 years apart in age, almost. Um, but there was so much in common. And uh, so the fact that one could speak across generations through the medium of our passion, which was art, um, it was uh, it was a moment which was something that led to other things. Um, Manmeet, if you can talk a little bit about the modernness and then talk about how we came across the third member on this panel, which makes us a trio uh, across South Asia. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Salima ji. <laughs> and thank you, Sapan, for getting us here and having this wonderful conversation. Um, so it's interesting how, you know, uh, we come across and how important tradition is for us. And when we look at contemporary art, we can't get our history away from us. So when it comes to modern artists, um, the kind of connections Pakistan, India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, we have, we are all taking around a very common language that uh, we see mirroring even in the artist's works like Raza, um, S.H. Raza, the great artist from India, he stayed back, one of the brothers, and Ali Imam was in Pakistan. And how it kind of moved on, or Shamza's work and F.M. Souza's work, how they mirror each other, how the borders came in, but the languages didn't really change. There was a common connection that um, was seen and that has that is still seen in so many ways. And I think that is what also got me connected to uh, Roshan. Uh, I think it was six months ago, uh, we started following each other's work on Instagram. And we ha started having a lot of discussions on it. And then we finally met uh, at India Art Fair <laughs> uh, in just January. Yeah. yeah, just <laughs> for a short brief. But it was great to have that conversation and then see how... Um, we are having very, uh, not even not even the inherent knowledge that we have. It's also the collective dream of peace. And it's also the collective dream of creative freedom that we all have. And how we are responding in these times, which are, I think, global crisis, as we can say. Um, and that has been, uh, this journey itself has been very exciting because um, all of this cannot happen without being connected to history. Uh, the most beautiful connection that I know is that Salima Ji is from Delhi. She was born in Delhi and I was born in Delhi. And um, before, uh, like in undivided India, my grandfather was born in Sialkot and so was Faisal, Salima Ji's father. So, you know, these connections that we have and we, we are coming along with those continuities and how we see they take play such an important role in our presence, in our being. And we can't get away with them even in our creative thinking. We are constantly thinking about all of these things while we are going ahead in time and looking for voices and emerging artists who are working um, in the issues and relevance of today uh, and how important it becomes to look at those artists, like just like the modernist when uh, they were working in that time, they are now, um, you know, they, they, they kind of define that time to us. It is so important for us to see these, the connection of two brothers being in two different countries and being famous in each country after after the division and how important it is for us today to know that art history of our region. So that relevance, I feel, is still present. And um, if you would want to add something to this, Russian. Uh, thank you so much. Salim Ajif, Namaste from Kathmandu. 
and uh, it's good to see you on meet uh, it's so great to you know like i've been hearing so much about salim aji from long long time and i'm so happy that i am seeing you virtually not meeting you personally yet but i think i think it's you know it's quite quite interesting how how south east is looking at the moment i think we we reflect each other and i think that is that is one of the most important connection and that is the bonding i think that is within south asia right and for nepal like you know when when there was no art colleges or even now as well lots of nepalese artists they went to india they went to pakistan they went to bangladesh to study art you know even my father he actually studied in east pakistan now currently you know in bangladesh and he was he was studying on the, uh, under jainul abudin and you know we have we have shared much so much shared so much you know common grounds common culture tradition you know there's so much common you know factors that is that is actually connecting us right and when i when i look at lots of artists who have actually been trained in india trained in you know pakistan and trained in bangladesh and when they come back and when i look at their work you know it it reflects each other and that is that is that is a sense we have actually built with them but it is actually coming very unknowingly within our art form and that is you know i think that is one of the strongest part that is not actually yet realized by the art community and you know like when you talk about south asia like i was in i was in uh, delhi in december attending an architectural conference and one of the journalists uh, from nepal kanak mani dikshit he was talking about you know why we keep on saying i'm from india i'm from pakistan i'm from bangladesh why can't we say i'm from kathmandu i'm from delhi and i'm from you know dhaka that would that would connect us even more right yeah. and uh, it it also gives us that sense that we in south asia we, uh, asia we have to coexist with each other and also if we if we connect as as you know south asia there's so much to share so much to take from each other you know and i think in nepal i think we can we can see that a lot as i said like there's more you know nepalese students who are going who are studying in india and who are studying in pakistan and bangladesh you know the the, the our senior artists they have studied in england india pakistan and bangladesh you know and then all this knowledge is being shared right and i think you know we need to find this uh, common space where we can actually share this uh in uh, as a common platform and i think you know like being a part of sapan today i think i realized that how important it is for us you know especially in this 20th century when when you think about what is happening around the world you know and yeah. you know we we, we we you know we we are probably in a better situation but i don't i don't think that we you know like we we need to look at the other side of the world but i think if we just stay in south asia and then we have to if you focus within ourselves i think there's so much we can give to the world yeah i totally agree with you you know you just mentioned your father studied under zainul abidin well you know he was the person who set up the finance department in peshawar university you know yes. so pakistan owes him so much um you know he was on the board of the college that i was a student in national college of arts he was an examiner uh, he was a juror so if there are all these things that are now wrapped up in history and very often we forget and i totally agree with you that we should talk of ourselves as a region i mean my dear late friend uh, kamla bashin who's she said i'm a south asian first then i'm a woman and oh, then i <laughs> an indian you know she always say i am i am a south asian first and i more and more as i have been coming in contact you know the university where i teach in uh, have now i'm um, a professor emeritus at the beacon house national university we started a program 20 years ago with the help of a visionary called madanjit singh who is uh, no more with us but he left his legacy for scholarships to enable his dream which was a artist coming together from south asia and studying in lahore because he truly believed that if they stayed with one another long enough 
not a seminar, not a short residency, but spending four years or two years in one another's company, they will build a network. And interestingly, you know, five years after he's gone, six years after he's gone, that network is very tangible. And these artists were spread all over South Asia, but also they're in the diaspora now. Some of them went to do mm. PhDs, somebody else, some of them, like when the Taliban took over two years ago um, in Afghanistan, they helped, their network helped artists to evacuate and go to other countries where they could pursue their art. So they have been a support to one another in difficult times also. And I think that is precisely why we need to have our own networks. And, you know, long time ago in the you know modern movement, there were one or two artists, you know, who didn't look West, but they looked towards East. They looked towards Japan, for example, as being something that could contribute to a new aesthetic which could be then converted into something, you know, it started with the Tagores and went on. Um, so I think that we are becoming more and more conscious of the fact that this is a regional movement that we are looking at right now. We are not calling it that as yet because we feel we are sort of still figuring out how it's going to become more mature. But certainly mm -hmm. we are looking about looking at emergent artists. We are looking to see what are the things that bother them? What are the things they're concerned about? Mm -hmm. What are the mediums that they are using? And the wonderful thing is that mm -hmm. they seem to be very fearless. That's what yeah. it seems to be. That they are able to cut across the constraints that are part of tradition. And while they take tradition with them, they don't are not obliged to follow the guidelines of tradition. And that I think it's something that working with Manmeet, I think I have certainly seen that. Um, I mean, being a much younger curator than myself, she's so much more observant about something that is Almost she gets a feeling that she's intuitive about something that's going to happen, you know. And for that, I really take my hat off to, you know, those who of you who are in the region, but also are able to stand outside the region and look at it from there. You know, so I think that is where we start <clears throat> firming up the bonds much more. Manmeet, would you like to talk about some of our discoveries, especially the collaboration things we're thinking about? Artists should collaborate in South Asia. Yes. yes. We should That's talk to one another. Let's do something together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, before before I do that, I just want to highlight Kushi Kabirji's uh, comment here. She says, wow, I studied with Roshan's father, Manoj Babu Mishra. This is Sapan. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, oh, so yeah, that's amazing <laughs> yeah it is it is truly amazing that we have you know and once you start sort of scrabbling around over there mm -hmm. you know and lifting the layers you find layers and layers yeah. and layers you know but I also want to add that it is now I think we are taking that pride in talking about our region um, yeah. it's changing because um, when I am trying to compare artists who have gone back, hi Kushiti, <laughs> um, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. I said just I'm so excited to find Manoj's son. <laughs> so so glad to see you too. <laughs> Myself. <laughs> yeah. So um. I think it is now that we are um, accepting uh, more with open heart the pride of our region and this interconnectedness that we are growing on with, um, irrespective of the global crisis uh, mm -hmm. that we see. There's massive change going on around the world at the moment. And we see the repetition of colonialization all over again through different regions. So I think that pride that we take, because for the longest time, I've also seen, I've, from what I have, I'm trying to you know, grasp is that 
that influence of West in our work mm -hmm. and that idea of acknowledgement that we look at towards the West. Um, that, that shift is seen now. We are talking about our region. We are talking about the crisis. And as you were mentioning, the discoveries that we have had, I mean, um, the sh there's an exhibition that we are working on, um, uh, which is going to be in London next year. And that is about artists who are working in their in their own countries in in that region, and talking about the relevance and the the time that they are going through. Mm -hmm. So even when we are looking at these young artists' work, somebody like um, um, as young as Suleiman Khilji, who's living in London but still, you know, talking about that time, but. Uh, so these these connections that we are looking at from um, India, Ver Veronica Saraf, she lives in Bombay, uh, she lives in Hyderabad, but she's responding to the times. She's responding to the idea what's, she's very, very sensitive towards the time. And that's what she wants her viewers to look at. This sensitivity is, I think, more seeping in at this point of uh, time. Yeah. I think a change, I feel, um, how do you see that in Nepal? Because that's what we have kind of seen in so many studio visits that we've done in Colombo or Dhaka or like thanks to Zoom, of course, to we've done um, to Nepal as well and in Pakistan and in India. Um, yeah, yeah. No, I think things has changed, right? I think uh, if I if I talk about artworks created by either Sashi Shah or Tam Nepali or or one of the senior artists, right? And if we compare that with the younger generation or the emerging artist, uh, their expression has changed, definitely changed. You know, now what was happening in the past, maybe it's not happening now, but what is happening now was not happening in the past, right? So there's yeah. there's no way we can compare two different expressions, but it is it is the contemporary voice. Okay. And I think, you know, in Nepal, like what I've realized is every expression is very much rooted to their history, culture, tradition, indigenous knowledge, and so on, right? Mm -hmm. But when they express it as a contemporary art form, it is it becomes a global language. It's not okay. about Nepal anymore. It becomes a global language, right? So any Nepali artist being working in Kathmandu, you know, be working within the four walls, they can equally talk about Palestine, like a Palestinian artist, right? Yeah. And that and that is beautiful because I think that that shows that how we are actually, you know, feelings or the same kind of emotions we have, you know, and how we care about each other. And we think more about humanity, humanity about, you know, ever than, you know, before. And that is so important. And I think like when I when I look at, you know, young emerging artists and their work, you know, their voices are so different. We, you know, we, we may talk about history, we may talk about culture, we may, may talk about gender equality, you know, we need, we may talk about women's issues. Or, or any global issues or environmental issues, right? But these are the languages, not only for South Asia, but it's for global as well, yeah. right? Yeah. But when you look at, we we'll look at the root of it, it's all growing from where they have actually grown, right? Yeah. And that is the most important thing, I think, because if we forget our root, if we forget our culture, if we forget our tradition, there's no way you can identify yourself. I think the best thing I think most of the Nepali artists, emerging artists have found is they have understood their culture, right? And the tradition, and they're actually trying to translate that into a global language, right? And I think that is that is very important. And it's it's actually, you know, very, a very powerful way to express as well. It might come as a, you know, painting, it might be an installation, it might be a sculpture. But I think, you know, like when you think about South Asia, you know, I'm being in the Tharagong Museum. I've got, I had lots of Asian, you know, artists from the region. They came to the museum, expressed their work. And I can see that, you know, when, when I look at their work, I see what is happening in Pakistan. I see what is happening in Bangladesh. I see what is yeah. happening in Sri Lanka, right? It reflects because they're talking about where they came from. And I think that is, that is, 
that is one of the important factor I've actually realized, especially within South Asia. And I that is one of the very strongest, yeah. very yes. right. strongest feeling. I think, you know, each of these, uh, all of South Asia yeah, has conflict. I think the thing we have seen, are, you know, all of us have been through conflict and I yes. continue yeah. to go through conflict. And whether it's small or large, whether it is within the nation state or whether it is between nation states, we yeah. have seen how, you know, uh, conflict, oppression, um, violation of human rights, uh, women's rights, all of these things we share, our, our concerns are across the region. Yeah. But we find very beautiful, fine ways which somehow, you know, a group has inherited or there are things learned from mothers and grandmothers, yeah. materials that certain parts of South Asia offer, uh, yeah. certain kinds of, you know, substances that they can use in their work, which is very local and very indigenous. Mm. And yet what you're saying is quite correct. The language is international because the vocabulary has really expanded, you know, mm -hmm. and they have seen what somebody in Puerto Rico is doing, you know. So they don't feel that they can be necessarily put in a little silo and say, okay, you're Bangladeshi, you have to work like this. Not at all. The world is, you know, now open for them. And yeah. we, yeah. in Manmeet and I have been seeing such wonderful work, you know, videos done in different parts of South Asia using language, which is a yes. contemporary language of technology. And yet when you see something, you know, this wonderful work we saw of just a boat going down the river yeah. and you're just looking at that and you find the essence of that river, which is of a particular place in Bangladesh and it becomes you, and it becomes your hope and your aspiration. Yeah. So I think the wonderful thing has, as you said, you know, you can, you can care deeply about Palestine because we get in touch with our own humanity uh, through art. And I think that one of the wonderful things is that when we as a region, as you know, Manmeet has been telling me so often, we have a collective memory. And I say, yes, yeah, we have absolutely. a collective memory. You know, but yeah. of course we have history also, you know, at one time the Mughal Empire stretched from Kabul to Burma, you know, exactly. so, there is, so there is that also. So exactly. we have these uh, shared memories, collective memories, and they all knitted together. And it's yeah. wonderful when artists uh, are beginning yeah. now, uh, who are coming yeah. out yeah. and into the world. And they are, and it's our role as uh, curators to find them to mm. identify them and give them a voice internationally. Yeah. I it's think also one, one thing. Feel, um, Sorry. It's also artists I feel that um, have mm. become so sensitive mm. about this situation. Hello? Yeah, can you hear you? Okay. Yeah, so I'm just like, it's also the artists I feel who've become so sensitive about this situation. You know, mm. it's, um, they, they themselves are looking at history as such an important point to start with uh, in their work. And that's when they go back and they go back and then then that's where we see the interconnectedness of the region a lot of times because they are looking in deep histories, they are looking at. And it's I completely agree with you, Roshan, when you say that they are reflecting in the contemporary voice that they have. Like the video that Salima Ji is talking about, you could be taking that as any river, the yeah. way that river is made, it, it's according to what you feel is right. Having said that, but that's such a beautiful and deep video. It's a poignant video where you get lost in waters and how that artist, his name is Palash Patachar, and he's kind of talking about the depth of what the climatic situation in Bangladesh is. And those connections, I feel, are... Um, very precious and they're very important to talk about at this point of time where um, we have to write the future past, don't we? Yes. yes. Yeah. I think it's so much to do with, you know, identity and, you know, 
and the and the and the memory, right? And when you when you when you think about you know a small country like Nepal, we have got 123 ethnic communities and 125 different dialects, right? And uh, you know, like even in this Zoom call, we are probably connected as capital cities. You know, we most of the the artists we know from the capital cities and what is happening in the west corner or eastern corner, we don't know anything about that. Yeah. And when you talk about these 123, 25 different ethnic communities, they have beautiful culture, you know, they have beautiful costume, they have got beautiful, you know, festivals, you know, rituals, jatras, all sort of things. And it's a packaged, uh, you know, with, with culture, art, trend, tradition. And now what I have been seeing is like lots of contemporary artists are actually going back to these communities, you know, and trying to connect with the communities, trying to find out what is actually being endangered, right? And it's a, it's a major issue in South Asia because things can just, you know, disappear over, over a year, you know, within a year. And yeah. I think these artists have found a way how to kind of use the indigenous knowledge the indigenous material, the material, material culture itself is so strong in South Asia, wow. you know, every yeah. plant, every, you know, anything you find within nature. You could pick up, has, pick up soil and make yeah, work with and it. Make and it has right? so much, so much. Every, that everything has got so much interconnection. Yeah. And yeah. Somehow we have forgotten those traditions and culture. And then through contemporary art, I think local artisans are being activated. You know, they might still produce the local traditional craft, but when it is, when the same technique is actually, uh, you know, learned by an artist, you know, they might come up with a completely different, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, yes. You know, and I would, I would want to add something to this. I know we're running out of time and we literally have last two minutes left, but um recently we saw a show in London called Textile Art uh, mm. Resonate the Politics. Um uh, and the climate. And that's where we really saw the indigenous, uh, me and Salima Ji, I was uh, lucky enough to go with her and have deeper discussions, but how indigenous art was kind of showcased there, displayed, talking about that time of particular area and mm -hmm. country. And it was a, it was a show from like artists from Australia and artists from India, everywhere. So it was very, the material memory that you're talking about, the indigenous art that you're talking about, was really present, how textile was used um, as yeah, such an important yeah. material, you know, to talk about time and um, how the old indigenous uh, skill has been used to talk about the contemporary issues. That yeah. was very interesting. And I think it's, it's more about like, when you think about the material culture, right? I think, you know, it's about the technique and the knowledge, right? And then nowadays I ask my question uh, sometimes like, as a curator, as a museum professional, do we really need to save everything, you know? And it's sometimes, you know, like when you took a, talk about the material cultures, you don't really need to save everything. It's something you need to document the knowledge from the indigenous community and you pass it to the next generation. And that is the best part of the living culture, right? So it doesn't mean that every basketries we produce has to be, you know, in a museum shelf. You know, you have to let it die with, with in a way dignity, dignified way, you know, you use it and you discard it. But as long as the knowledge exists, you know, it yeah. can be traditional, it can be contemporary and it can be anything else. And I, I think our generation, I think it's a time to realize that, you know, like I think sometimes we just need to accept what material is that. And yeah. we just, you know, create something. We, if it is, if it is a, you know, household goods, we use it and discard it, right? If that knowledge is saved, you, anybody can create it at any time. And I think what you know, this this 21st century has given us is that ability to kind of learn that knowledge and pass it to the next generation. And that's, I think, what is required the most in South Asia because so many things are endangered. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. This is going to be an exciting journey to do this. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. This has been the most exciting and a very thought-provoking discussion, very reflective, but also giving us the, the seeds of, of uh, connectivity and, 
and 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 in these days of conflict, as Sadima mentioned, that we each of our countries is in some sort of a conflict situation with each other mm. and with the, within also. And I think art really connects us and takes us beyond the the immediate conflicting situations. Um, this uh, everywhere we've got in the chat, we've got so many comments appreciating this discussion. And uh, you know the the whole uh, the 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 not only of connectivity but also the value of tradition which binds us and our history that binds us. We can't forget our history if we're moving forward. So I think those were that was a very incisive discussion. There are a, num a few questions here. We'll have uh, you know next ten minutes or so for questions, very pointed questions. Vidya, would you like to read them out, or should I read them out? Yes, yes, I will. So I will. You. Thank you, so one at a time. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much for such an insightful discussion. Uh, we have questions in the chat. The first question I'd like to pose is from Sher Afghan Tareen, one of our volunteers. He his question is directed to Miss Manmeet. He says, "In your study of South Asian artists in London, have you discovered any relationship between art and mental health?" How do South Asian artists draw upon art to re redress trauma of displacement and migration? Well, that's a very important question, and thanks for that. Um, trauma, displacement, and migration, uh, identity, sense of belongingness are very important aspects in artist practice, especially who are not living in their own region. Uh, especially the diaspora who is um, struggling with all of these things. And it comes across um, as completely parallel narrative for artists who are living outside, outside, especially who are born here or who kind of moved, migrated in a very young age. Um, they, these are the discussions they are mostly looking at because that's their crisis. That's the time that they have gone through and this is what their personal and lived experience is. And they are talking about this a lot, uh, especially in South Asians. Thank you. Um, we have another question for, by Irfan Mufti. He says that... Um, why has art has why has art a limited role in collecting peoples and cultures that 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 are further sunk in the last few years because of religious extremism? How can we liberate the art from populist control and religious extremist and use it for strengthening bonds within the South Asian community? Well, <clears throat> I'd like to take that one on. Um, I think each of our countries in South Asia. Uh, is subjected to some form of extremism or the other. It can be religious, it can be ethnic, um, linguistic. I mean, they're all, all manner of extremists. Um, and we are seeing it uh, grow, unfortunately. But on the other hand, you also find that the resilience of the artist is also growing. At one time, you found that artists will not talk about that in their work. Today, you find that it, the, the, the rebound or the response sometimes can be ironic, it can be sarcastic, it can be full of humor, uh, so that, you know, artists employ all kinds of clever ways of actually saying the emperor doesn't have any clothes on, you know, making fun of that extremist idea, <clears throat> because they have also learned that running away from the problem is not going to be helpful. And their, their response comes quite naturally, quite organically. I've seen it happen in, with uh, young Pakistani artists. We've seen it happen in the other uh, countries. Uh, Manmeet and I have been coming across um, so much of that as we've looked at you know, Sri Lanka and so on. So I think we will find the response coming, whether it's in the form of a beautiful embroidery which is embroidering uh, a scene from newspaper headlines, okay? So you're making fun of that extremist news and you're doing it through a wonderful embroidery. So artists are employing all kinds of creative ways to talk about extremism. Of course, they don't have social media to help them. Of course, they don't have the political 
you know, commissars who are taking and making use of. But, you know, always, whether it's a poet, whether it's a musician, whether it's a filmmaker, whether it's an artist, will always find that the truth will be there and someone is able to tell that truth. Thank Great. you so much for your for such an insightful answer. Um, there's another question posed by Ms. Fozia. She says, the knowledge about indigenous art should be saved. Please say something about promoting that knowledge to be functional in order to be used and not only saved in documentation. This question is specifically posed to you, Mr. Roshan. Yeah, I think uh, when you talk about indigenous knowledge, you know, I think most of the artists who are actually meeting indigenous artists or, you know, trying to understand the local material, right? That is already a form of, you know, documentation or that is already a way how they're trying to understand the knowledge, how it was, you know, used by the community and how they create, you know, these, these objects or materials, right? For example, like if there is a musical instrument, you know, which is which is made by the community, right? And if it is within the community, it's functional. It's used, discarded, they will make another one and they use, right? But think about it. If the same material goes to a museum or a collection, that becomes almost like a dead object, right? It might have a documentation, but that musical instrument might have been forgotten by the community. And we really don't want to be in that situation. For example, like I work in a repatriation campaign in Kathmandu, right? And uh, think about, you know, like we have repatriated so many objects, but think about, you know, a Vishnu's statue, which is which was in the museum, right? But when you repatriate that and put it into the temple, from next day onwards, it will have the colors, the vermilions, the, the, the you know the grains, uh, the milk. Everything will be poured onto that onto that devi or devata or an object, right? And that becomes functional. And I think that is what we want because as long as it's documented, it doesn't need to stay in a museum kind of a space. It can be handed back to the community, you know. And you know, like. When you, when you have a beautiful stone image in the museum, you'll read every single contour of that object. But when it is at the temple, you might lose the conjure over the period of times over hundred years, right? It, it, may, it may become a stone, but when it is documented, the, the next generation will have the ability to create that. And that is how we need to document the knowledge, to document the indigenous culture. Right. And I think there's a there's a functional part when that doesn't become functional, it will probably when something like that will become a dead object. So I think there's so much, you know, the, the intangible aspect with these material culture, which we have actually not recorded at, at all, which is actually a part of the oral history that is also not recorded. So I think being, you know, being being professionals within this field, I think that documentation is part part is important, but we need to understand what is functional and what is an object. And they're two different things. Thank you so much. There is just one last question that I'll be taking. Um, again, this is from Sher of Gantarin. He says, uh, can you please share some insights into the leading role of textile arts for community building in South Asia? Salimaji, uh, you should take this I question. Mean, that's yours. <laughs> 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 we could actually take it together. You you go first. <laughs> well, I this think is that, um, more and more uh, as women enter into studio practices, because let's there's been a sea change in the number of women artists. Which I mean, I at my age have seen it, you know, multiply and becoming. Uh, at one time, you know, my some of my male colleagues would say, "Salima, what about doing an exhibition of male artists? You've done so many of." female artists. So I said, you know, you've had a 5,000 year advantage. Okay, so now it's a woman's century. But actually, the fact that textile is so close to you, it's a thing you put next to your skin. And mm. therefore, it is the most intimate thing that you have. And no wonder that many, very many women artists have actually looked towards domestic processes and processes that are occur within the four walls of the home. And then when, once they have seen that, okay, this can be an art material, 
then it comes back into the community also because there are women artists in Pakistan and India, I'm sure in Bangladesh and elsewhere, who are looking at doing their fine arts practices within the community, like bringing artisans together and cut breaking down the, yes. the kind of space or the kind of distance between fine artists and people who were artisanal, had artisanal skills, and making sure that that hierarchy is then set aside and it becomes a community project with perhaps one artist or perhaps the artist and an artisan leading where it's going to. So hmm. we are seeing this happen, and I'm sure all three of us have seen that. The various, and you talked about the various materials, I think textiles, it's happened more than anything else because of the fact it has always been community work in all of our uh, cultures from wide one end right to the other end of South Asia. And therefore, no surprise then that it has given uh, support to communities. It's happened with carpets made designed by or made or suggested by artists in Kabul and goes right up to, you know, across the subcontinent. So yeah. this is something that we are extremely proud of and delighted that we have been able to do it in our area. And Manmeet, I'm sure you've seen the same. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I would also like to add another point that textile has a very strong history in our region. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we get out of our region, we realize how important that history was. Like, what happened, the indigo history from Bangladesh and Bengal side, or the cotton history, or the, or the strong role of Khadi, you know, mm -hmm. all these reasons make it more important that we talk about this material itself. And it's also very emotional through the region. Our, our region, everywhere you go, textile is a very important part. Even if you're talking about mm -hmm. fast fashion at the moment, it's also Bangladesh that's going through its own, you know, uh, crisis because of textiles and what is fast fashion doing to ecology in that region and other aspects. So for keeping all of these situations also together, I think that emotionality comes in between. And when the artists start working with it, then they look into that history of the material, which adds on to their own historical narrative. And to add on to it, all these skills are also, you know, sometimes learned from their grandmothers, as Salimaji said, or their mothers. So they, there are different layers to it, they, like different genres that come in between, which makes textiles so important, even in community building, because they are common, common conversations amongst South Asian regions. And that becomes important, I feel. Thank you. Thank you so much. This has been, we can go on and on. I mean, this conversation is so interesting and there's so many questions coming out of it that we'll probably have another session in due course. So I would like to thank all of you for this wonderful uh, discussion and thank to you. look at peace from the from the angle of, uh, of, uh, of art, because I think that's really the most binding of elements in our region at the moment. And I want so, to say uh, happy birthday to I would like, besides thanking yeah. you, I would like everybody to please stay on. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, uh, but I did, we had a good uh, sense of questions. But I would, I please, before we move on, uh, I would like that everybody just turn on their uh, videos so that we can take a snapshot of all the participants as a record, a group photo. So please, everybody, turn on their your okay. videos. Irfan, we can't see you. Siraj. Yes. Please. Okay. okay. And and we've got more than one set of people. Yes, please. Samita, Nazir, Padma. Saira.
Okay. And we couple, one more page. Couple, one more couple screen. More second. Yeah, a couple more seconds. <laughs> so, uh, okay. We are all, all set. All done? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and before, uh, I would like everybody to just bear with me for a few minutes before we go on to the our five grand finale. Uh, we first of all, we really, we really want your feedback. So do do give your feedback uh, because we learn mm -hmm. from you and we value all everybody's feedback. Uh, bring everybody's attention to is that so far we've been doing our, our work without any support but as we are expanding uh, we now also need besides the moral support financial support too so if you have already contributed thank you because many have but if you have not please consider a small monthly contribution it will mean a lot no amount is too small or too big so you can donate online at sapannews.com.donate asking it's also in the chat the the uh, the link so uh, we're asking uh, please ask your friends also to pitch it wherever they can and we would just uh, i'm sorry a bit stuck i would like to before we go on to our uh, as i said the grand finale i would like to thank everyone who made this event possible today especially the panelists, Salima, Manmeet, Roshan. It was wonderful to have you here. We would also like to thank all of you who come and participated in this, joined us, and would especially like to uh, thank the volunteers behind the scenes, without whom we couldn't have done this. This is one of the hallmarks of, of uh, Sapan, people who contribute to make these, these events successful. So for Jay Deba for coordinating the opening video, edited by Amit Singh, and the digi digital pitch team, Rida Sharif, for the Kamla Basin song video. The Sapan team, including our volunteers, Sara, Emma, uh, Sara Arshad, Sherab Kantari, Mansi Channa, Alia Rab, Iswandiyar Khan, Catherine Abraham, for facilitating online engagement. We need everyone's help with this. To please, so please join and share our work with your networks also. Uh, if there have been any sort of uh, hitches in between or or so you know please bear with us for that we particularly would like to thank Sab, Bartola and Bina for their hard work Kushi Kabir, Kavita Srivastava, Bipasha Saeed, Vidya Kakra, Namrita Sharma, Irfan Mufti, Saifullah Sefi, Vishal Sharma uh, and every else without whom this event would not have been possible. And thank you and look forward to seeing you next time. Remember to fill in the feedback form and contribute. And goodbye for me now, from me now, as I hand over to Kushi Kabir for the song and closing remarks, which has been wonderful to be with all of you. So here, Kushi, it's, it's your baby. Thank now. you, Radhi. You've done a wonderful job. Greetings to everyone on Sapan's third anniversary. And I find my Fr college friend's son today speaking, so that's extra an extra bonus, extra anniversary present. So I'm Kushi Kabir from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Along with me are Sohana Ahmed Ravi. and Basha Said, also from Dhaka, Bangladesh. We are a part of Sapan and of Sangat. Sangat is a <laughs> South Asian feminist network founded by the iconic Kamla Bhaseen who we've talked about today too. We span three generations between the three of us, a 20 year gap between Sohana and myself and a 30 year gap between Sohana and Nipasha. So we don't, we cannot beat uh, the gap between uh, uh, Salima and Manmeet, but uh, we are 50, close enough. For Sapan's third anniversary, we present a song that was written by the quintessential South Asian, Kamla Basin and set to a popular Hindi song, which everyone heard in their childhood, Hai Apna Dil To Avara, 
though none of us, th the three of us, none of us know or understand Hindi or Urdu very well, we sing this song, Tumhara Saath Milne Se, a song that Kamla wrote. It's a song of solidarity, love and friendship with great passion because precisely because we believe in solidarity, love and friendship. So we've uh, recorded this song just a couple of days back and I would request uh, uh, the people behind to start the video now. Ina? One second. One second. Okay, we'll wait. No worries. Sorry. I can see more. Yeah, I, I thought somebody else was sharing it. I'll just share it. Yeah. This has been an excellent, and there were so many questions and a lot of, uh, yeah, started screen share. <laughs>
Thank you all. Amazing, Kushi and team. Amazing. Actually, we don't want to leave. <laughs> no one wants to leave. Thanks. 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 Yeah. I will I'll yeah. stop the recording. I'll stop the recording and I think this is the last this is the final, right, Rani? It is Can the I final. We are all ready to leave. Sefi, I wish you good. could you could start that uh, clapping voice behind it the way you do it in the Twitter. Clapping. <laughs>